Hi, CVC So Podcast listeners. Welcome to episode 31 of the CVC So Podcast. We're going to pick up where we left off. We started in episode 30. We started going through an assessment together. And I think it was kind of enlightening, you know, for me and for, you know, the other host. So the, speaking to the other host, we have Jordan. I say hi, Jordan. Hi, Jordan. Hi, hi Jordan and Meg. Hi, Jordan. Hi, Jordan. <laughs> All right. So Meg today, so we, we're going to pick up where we left off in the last episode, which was we were doing an assessment, right? Jordan was acting as the VC. So in that particular episode, I was acting as the CEO of a small business and Meg was the CFO. Now we're going to pick up where we left off, but we're going to switch roles. So Meg is going to take, yeah, right. Meg is going to be the VC. So, so she's going to take over the assessment from where we left off. Jordan is going to be the CEO, the boss man, and I'm going to ask him for a raise later on. And um, I'm going to act. But you're like the this. You're... I know, but I really suck at money. Yeah. Everybody knows that. Everybody knows that. I mean, so I don't think anybody. So then you might not want to ask for a raise. Well, I'm going to ask him for a raise. And I'll have to check with my CFO. And I'll prove it. But see, this is a separation. And we'll go bankrupt. Funny, this is an interesting segue because this is where we, I think we, we kind of left off at se uh, separation of duties. So I can't give myself a raise. I have to ask my boss, who's the CEO. He needs to approve it. And then maybe I can process it, but he'll probably have to sign off on it too. So there's your separation of duties. I said duties. How do you, you know, I don't want to go on a tangent, uh, but as Meg's kind of getting herself into the the VC soul role, how would you talk to a small business about that? You know, uh, that's come up with me a few times where it's like, they almost it's like, why, you know, it's me and my husband. How do we, how do we separate duties? You know, like, yeah. Well, so if you can't, I mean, it's the same concept. I can't prevent all bad things from happening. So then I need to have something in place to detect it and then respond to it. So if you can't or it doesn't it isn't feasible for you to put that control in place, a mitigating control would be uh, some method to detect that somebody made an unauthorized or an unintended transaction. Mm -hmm. So where you don't have enough people to do the formal sort of separation of duties, is there some audit trail or something that we can leverage should something bad happen? So I think that's and how I guess you we did, tackle we it. did touch on them. That came out of the assessment too. That came in that conversation. The CFO said, yeah, we do that. And then you said, I don't do that. Or I don't know if we do that. And we said, well, do you have monitoring? And yeah. Yep. Yep. That's exactly. why the assessment's so great. Well, yeah, because there's definitely going to be. And sometimes, I mean, honestly, just because the assessment asks that, you may get to the end of the assessment and start working on the roadmap and just accept that risk. Right, just because it's a risk doesn't mean you have to mitigate it. So we don't have the ability to do real separation of duties. We're just going to acknowledge and accept that risk. That's legit. Mm -hmm. We can do mm -hmm. it. It's a good point. All right, Greg, are you a great point? Evan, you are right. so wise. Speaking of wisdom, you know where you get that from? The Bible. Well, I suppose. Yes, you can get it from others. But you, the other place I think you can get it is experience with pain. Mm. Are not. That's where you get it. The more you beat yourself up or allow yourself to beat, get yourself beat up. I'm just, that's why I tell my wife, she's like, why did you do that stupid thing? And I'm like, wisdom, baby. Read chapter one of James. Yeah. Just trying to get more wisdom for me. That's all. Awesome. I'm not reckless. All right. I'm a wisdom so, obtainer. Um, how are you guys feeling Speaking about what we've done up, so far? Um, what do you think about the, the Tyson? Oh, that's right. We, we have the Tyson. Meg, I'm sorry, he brought up sports. What? Yeah. This podcast has completely changed. Um, so tonight we've got Mike Tyson going up against. Yes. Yeah, that Paul. Jake guy, Jake Paul. Yeah. yeah. I'm Getting hoping Tyson. Spicy from what I can see. I'm a child of the 80s. You know, I, went, I graduated high school in 1988, so I was very much a Tyson fan in this heyday. Yes. And being an older guy, too, I think now, you know, you remember like your grandpa would be like, all right piece of shit, you know, whatever. I kind of have that mentality too. So it's like, I don't know Jake Paul, uh, but you know, he's a young kid. So I'd like to see him get his ass kicked. And the fact that I'm a Tyson fan. So that's where I'm going. Isn't but you know, Jake you know, the, the, the good news for 
for Paul would be that uh, it's just uh, wisdom. It's wisdom coming his way. Well, at that and $40 million. Isn't he the guy that was just a YouTuber and, and then he started talking shit about being able to beat all these people and he has pretty much beat them? Not just a YouTuber, but like an influencer. Yeah. Influence. Influencer. I think he started what like... What everybody's striving to be today. He's got 20.8 million followers on YouTube. Wow. Uh, I don't know where he's, I mean, he started, I think him and his brother, right? And isn't his brother named Logan? So Logan and Jake Paul both are like YouTube freaks. And I think Logan is like a WWE guy. Really? Yeah. That's interesting. Imagine that household raising those kids. Yeah. But he's, (laughs) you know, he seems to be a pretty good businessman because he's started this, this drink called, what the hell is it called? There's some drink, like energy drink. Energy drink. That he started and i'm going to think about it as soon as the podcast is over guaranteed and now i think he's also working on creating some kind of like food item thing so it's good to see them branching out and you know making businesses out of it i mean they're making a ton of money has and he beat like, everybody that he challenged celsius no he lost one fight he did yeah i can't remember who he lost to but yeah some Oh, it was Tyson Fury. Do you know how that is? I don't. Tyson Fury, I don't think he's the heavyweight champion of the world anymore, but he was. His brother fought Jake Paul. And he's not a great he's not a great boxer by any means, but he beat he beat him. That's the one guy. So Prime Energy is Logan Paul's drink. There you go. Prime Energy. And then Celsius is like sponsoring Jake Paul versus Mike Tyson. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, Celsius is one of my favorites, but I've tried those some good. of those healthier ones, and my gosh, they're so nasty. Being that Celsius has like two sounds to it, I like to say it with the lisp, so I say Celsius. Shocker! All right, let's do the assessment. Assessment. Yes, Meg, would you please get started with the assessment? Okay. The temperature is rising in here. The Celsius on the <laughs> degrees is getting hot. So if you can I start have, the I have a Celsius, look at you. Oh my gosh, he has got a Celsius. It's so I can do the assessment. Yes. So, Meg, would you please start with the assessment? Yes. You are no, the not, I will not do it with the list. No, I, I will answer with the list because um, I have a list. But I'm the CFO. I don't usually talk to a lot of people. Okay. It just, just makes sure that you get paid your proper salary. Let's see how that goes, Evan not talking. Yeah, I should just shut up. I should just let you guys go. Are you share your, are you hey, share? Yes, that got a smile out of you. I'm happy. I'm the CEO, and this is my C- CFO. Yes. Yes, I make sure that everybody's got the proper salaries. Hey, if I do that, is it going to be this screen on a chair? We're a small business, Ooh. and we don't do security very well. We sell with it. Yeah. Lots of with it. Uh, some of the with it people like, some of the with it people don't like. Uh, Would you like to buy one of our with it? Okay. Current assessment. That's the screen I want. There we go. All right. So we're on HR. We're in section 3.1, if anybody's following in the tool, the security studio, security assessment tool. Rainy. Yes. All right. Okay. How are you guys All feeling right. so far? We're going to pick this back up. We're now in chapter three, or, or well, it's not really a chapter. Section. Section three. Um, how are you guys feeling so far about what we've already done? Be nice. Well, it's it's been good. Uh, you know, it seems pretty early in the process, but I can. Those were some interesting questions you asked. I think this is stupendous. Nice. I'm glad you. I'm glad you've uh, got a lot out of it so far. So next, we're going to talk about screening. How's your screening process going with? you know, external candidates. You guys do well, background checks? Yeah, we definitely do background checks. Um, do we do drug tests anymore, Evan? Do, I'm sorry, did you say do we do drugs or do we do drug tests? Drug tests. I, I can't remember if we still do those. Uh, actually, we do in the manufacturing side. Yeah, we do for some employees, not for all. Yeah. Yeah, our HR person isn't here, but yes, we do. we do background checks. 
Is that on all, on of our, all yeah. employees? Or all yeah, potential employees? Part, yeah. It's part of, we do have an HR process uh, for onboarding a new, a new employees and, and yeah, background check is a part of that. Okay. What about we have, verifying? We have a pretty high turnover, so that, that's kind of important. Mm-hmm. Say that again, Evan. We have a pretty high turnover, especially in the manufacturing side of the business. So, yeah, background checks are really important. We do that on all employees, but the the drug tests, not all. Okay. All right, that's good to know. What about the verification of their credentials? How are you guys doing in that? What do you mean by the verification of their credentials? Well, like um, usually they have their their college history. They have oh yeah, like the resume, the stuff on their resume. Yeah, the letters behind their name, stuff like that. Yeah, we we do. Again, I know we have a process. Our HR person isn't here, but we do have a documented process that um, would we we would reach out to their references on their on their resumes. Okay. I don't. I think that's really all we do. We just call the references and have a handful of questions for them. Okay. Prior employment isn't really a thing yeah. for you guys. Okay. So if prior employment, okay, now we're going to talk about that because if prior employment is the only thing they don't do, that would be a false then, right? You're now stepping out of your role and asking? I am stepping out of my role and now we're, we're talking about this. Yeah, so you can you could take this literally because literally it says there's a formal process and procedure to ensure that background checks, and then gives you examples and verification again examples that they're done on all contractors, yeah, you know, like everybody. Yeah, it's not so much the details. I think so. You could find something in the background checks that they're not doing. The important part is that. According to one that they're considering it, the background checks are done and that they're consistent. You know, there's some formal process around it. The details of getting into the different types of checks, how far back you go, all that stuff, you could, if that came up in the conversation, you could certainly put that in the notes to justify why you answered the question. But the details typically, I won't go too far into. Unless okay. there's something like really obvious, like you do, okay, you do back, background checks, but you don't do criminal ones, you know, which seems like a big deal to me. But as the assessor, when I answer true, false on any of the questions, I'm asking, I'm answering true, false because I can justify why I answered true, false, if that makes sense. Okay. All right. Okay. Back into my VC so role. Let's talk the same thing. For third party contractors and any other third party, do you guys do the background checks and verification for them? Uh, hmm. I guess I don't know about that. I'm I'm sh- I'm sure about our employees because, like like Evan said, we have a lot of turnover, so we've we've nailed the onboarding for for that. But contractors and third parties, I'm not aware of what the uh, what the if we do background checks on them. Okay. Who do you think would be the appropriate person to speak with to find that out? Well, I guess actually that would be me because all the contractors, they get paid, right? So I'm the one who makes sure they get paid. Uh, We ask about it. We inquire about it, but we don't validate it. So it would be hard for me to say, yes, it's done with all of the contractors. So I would would say maybe most, but yeah, not all of them. Okay. All right. And then security policies. Is management in support of and making sure that the security policies, I know we talked earlier and it sounds like you had security policies, but we weren't sure how active they were. Yeah. I haven't seen them in a while and, and I don't even know where to find them. Okay. However, do does management embrace kind of the content of what's in them and that's how they kind of lead the organization well i remember signing off on them i mean i think we i think we had someone send us i think uh, we had some templates that we found online and uh, we looked them over they looked pretty good so i um thought yeah you know that's what sounds like security and i signed them 
but but yeah, I don't know. Like I said, I haven't seen them since. I'm not sure if you asked a staff member where they are. I don't know if they'd know where to find them. So I think generally people do things pretty secure, but I, I guess I don't know if they're following policies. Yeah, we don't actively we don't actively enforce them or endorse them. I mean, the original reason why we created those was we had customers who were asking for them. So I would say, you know, most people probably don't know that we have them. No. What about the rest of the staff? Are they monitored to possibly detect um, cybersecurity events? Are they monitored? Yeah. So is there something in place? Uh, let's see. Like things like my screen, you know, are you are people able to see your screen when you're working where they could po potentially see a password? You know, are we monitoring to make sure that that people are hmm. not doing those things? I don't, I don't know that we monitor that we do. I mean, we have a we have a surveillance system. There's a couple cameras in the building, but I don't know that we've used them to monitor our staff. We can't have kind of an open office, so you know you could probably come around and see what people are doing on their. Their screens is that what you're kind of getting at? Yeah, yeah, or or other things. It doesn't have to be just that. We do have a we we invested the last year in a um, employee monitoring uh, software, like this thing that kind of makes you see if if your employees are actually doing work. You know, I want to make sure that they're not messing around. You know, when they're supposed to be working. Okay. Uh, so we have that, but we only really kind of reference it if. If someone's been, um, you know, hasn't been pulling their weight. This is specifically to detect any type of event that could be happening from their activity. Like on the, on their computers? Yeah. Yeah, we, I mean, we've got some. I don't know how actively we monitor it, but, you know, like Jordan said, we've got, we've got software. We've got the ability to, but I don't know how consistent we are in using it. Yeah, we don't review it regularly or anything. All right. Uh, time out from the VC so roll. It looks like my screen is frozen. Is it actually moving for you guys? No, it's no, not. It's not. All right. I'm going to reshare. A VC so with technical difficulties. Yeah. What's some advice when, when you're having technical difficulties as a VC so? Like, yeah. I like right. transparency. I just, tell them, I just tell them I'm having technical difficulties, you know, because they can relate to that. All right. The next couple questions have to do with awareness, training. But first, I want to make sure that you understand the difference between the awareness and training, because sometimes people can get that confused. Awareness is more of like the quick trainings that are done on some type of frequency, but not very, not long in length. Whereas training is usually, it's more in depth. So I want to know specifically if all of your employees, your contractors, your third-party people, are they all getting security awareness training before they're given their access to information resources? Uh, well, I can speak for, again, the employees side of things. Uh, we do train them on the employee handbook when they're hired. Okay. And I think there's some things in there that talk about, you know, what's expected. You know, and I, I haven't gone through that handbook myself in a while, but I'm pretty sure there's some things about, you know, how to, you know, you know, don't click on emails that are fishy. Okay. All right. But you're not sure about, Evan, do you know about the third party and contractors, if they're getting some kind of awareness training? Depends on the contractor, but like the contractors that we have that are working in the building. They do go through the training, but other contractors, no, we don't. We don't enforce any training or awareness stuff for them. All right, I'm gonna jot down a little note here to myself, so bear with me. Problem. All right, so let's see what's the difference between these two questions. Sorry, one is okay. So the first one was on granted access before to information before they're 
do they get the training before being granted? And the second question has more to do with just, are they getting the security awareness training on a periodic basis? So are they getting it throughout after they've been hired? Um, I don't believe we, 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 uh, it's just in, when we onboard them, we give them training, um, okay. on the All handbook, right. like I said, I don't think we do that again. And now focusing on privileged users. So you understand what privileged users means, except the term you're used to. Privileged users. So I would say, you know, like, uh, does that mean like executives? It could mean, but it could be other people like typically in your um, HR, anybody that's that's exposed to information. How would I phrase that? Anyone uh, that have access to things to, that, that has are more sensitive? Private, yeah, to more sensitive, has privy to private information. Then those those people would be privileged users. So do they get specialized instruction and training? You know, I guess, I mean, so, so Evan, you, uh, you would be kind of a privileged user. If I'm understanding this, you're, you're in account, you know, you're, you're a finance guy. Do, do we, do we give you special training? No, no, I don't think so. Uh, I think just relying on, you know, my, my accounting training, but not like, I like training on you know, being a privileged user in the system? No, nothing formal. Now, just to talk about that one, I'm out of the CVC so role. I marked the second one false because I feel like since he asked that question to you, Evan, and you're the CFO, that would be a no, right? Yeah, I think. And privileged users, because this is a question that, I mean, often you get like, what do you mean, you know, privileged user? And privileged user is this user with a user of a system, a user of an application that has elevated privileges, right? They can do things with the system that normal users can't. I'm equating it to like an administrator account or a root user account on a Linux system, it's those kinds of things. And the reason why you know, we ask about this is those accounts are higher risk. Um, maybe not as... I mean, it could be likelihood and impact, but you know, if one of those accounts is compromised, it's a it's a big problem, and so that's why we ask: do, do these users who have administrative rights to a server, to a database, to an application, do they receive specialized instruction on how important, you know, and things that we would want in the specialized instruction would be things like, I don't use that administrative account for day to day work. Mm. Right. I use my day-to-day -day account, and I only use the privileged account during you know, privileged activities. You know, stuff like that. So, that's so this, what would, this would be a good. Towards. This would be a good time to uh, maybe bring up the IT department. Like, do they? Because they would be the ones that have admin rights, right? So, do they get special training? And and I wonder too if um. You know, is this is this a good time to ask them if everyone's an admin on their system? Like, are you able to install things you, you know, on your own, or do you have to add, ask the IT department? Would that be something here? I can't remember if that comes up later, maybe in the technical side of things. Yeah, it does. It comes up there too. But yeah, that's all. That's also a privileged account, right? An account that has administrative rights or privileges, to, even to, if it's to a workstation, so you can. And this is a common thing, right? There's lots of different angles that you could take at this. Answering, you know, the most risky ones would be, you know, obviously the server ones, you know, the critical application administrative user accounts. So you could stop there if you wanted to as the assessor and then just continue. Or you could dig deeper. I mean, a lot of it's going to come down to and do you have enough information to answer true, false, and justify why you answer true, false, and just move on? Or, you know, in your opinion, as you're assessing, it's like, you know what, I want to go a little bit deeper on this one because I think it's important. Um, that's justified, too. Even though the questions are binary, how you approach the questions doesn't necessarily have to be. It's not going to be perfect think, anyway. 
I think that's a great tip. I mean, at least that cleared some cobwebs for me. The that um, just the idea of do you have enough to answer the question? Because you can go into when you're talking about the risk and start consulting on the risk. You can go into all the details when you're tackling it. You know, but at, at once you have enough to answer this question, I think that's that's a great point because I think that's I think that's the temptation is to feel like you need to talk about each one of these. You're consulting them as you're doing the assessment. And maybe some people, that's a great idea to do it that way, I don't, you know, however they want to do it. But it almost makes it clearer to me and frees my mind to be like, if I can answer this question, I can move on. Yeah. yeah. Feel free to move on. You know, I mean, depending on how the conversation's flowing, yeah, you also have the liberty to go deeper. But yeah, that's usually, okay, I've got enough to answer this question and it looks like you know as i'm reading the room they're ready to move on i'm ready to move on then just move on is it safe to say that all admins are privileged users yeah pretty much i think so, I think what so. about the opposite are all privileged users admins no what makes a privileged user and that's what some people struggle with answering you know this question uh, they haven't haven't made the differentiation between what a privileged user is and what a privileged user isn't. Mm. And so that's an exercise in and of itself that is a good, healthy exercise to do. Like, let's define for ourselves in this organization what is a privileged user and what's not, right? Because in some cases, it is pretty cut and dry, right? You've got just normal users. And then you've got clearly users with elevated privileges that can do more things with the system. And it's a little more obvious, but then you, know, you can go down all kinds of rabbit holes within the assessment and within any particular question, because then you could also think, well, what if it's a user that's within a group that has, you know, the ability to change printer settings and you know, delegate permissions to folders and stuff versus those that don't? Is that a privileged user? Right. And that's, and that's the part of the exercise is it's not for me to define that. Going through the exercise and you defining that, I think, it, with my help, but during the assessment would not be the time to do it. That would be the time to define for ourselves what's a privileged user and what's not. Good. All right, we're going to move on to post-employment processes. And there's a couple ways. So just to clarify what we mean by that, this is about people that leave for different reasons and how are we doing with their removal of accounts, password changes, et cetera. So how do you feel like that process is working for you guys with involuntary Terminations. So you stick into. First of all, do you have a process? And if yeah. so, stick into it. Yeah. Okay. And 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 I think you know, like like I said before, we I think we really the onboarding process we nailed, and the offboarding process I think we've nailed. We 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 had, you know, our I wish our HR person was here. She she uh, she really is a phenomenal person, and she 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 came from a bigger company that had, you know, bad things happen when someone was fired and and she learned her lesson and she came bringing all that experience and, and we've had that too someone causing some trouble deleting all their stuff and and really opening up we've had that in the past so she really buttoned that up we got we got a prospect okay and i'm gonna assume that you're also doing well with the voluntary terminations no one really wants to leave so it's always involuntary all right <laughs> didn't you say there was high turnover earlier well, that's more of the manufacturing side. On the admin side, yeah, we've we're all pretty much old timers. Nice. Okay, section four. Now, are we going to continue with me doing this, or are we switching every section, or is it every every episode? Every episode. Every episode. Okay. You say you got enough in you. I do. Are you getting tired? Mm -hmm. I do. All right, asset management. How are you guys doing with your inventory, inventorying assets, physical devices, systems within your organizations? How's that going? I assume our IT team has 
things figured out there. I've never seen an inventory, but I guess I don't know what happens to things when how it gets documented. Yeah, and, and due to the fact that this has kind of a financial impact, we have a physical we have a physical inventory. So we know all the systems yeah, on the physical inventory. Does that include data? It does not. So just more your hardware and software? Software, I don't know. I mean, software, we, Jordan, I mean, we have some people here who I think bring their own software that we have. I don't know if we have a really good control over who installs things on their computers. Yeah, I don't, I don't think we know. All right, let's talk about this one. I marked both false. The first one mainly because, or it was because no data was inventory. Is that correct? Well, I don't know. Well, that, because that question says physical devices and systems within the organization are inventoried. So it's not asking about data. All right. Because we, we think about in the CVC so training, you know, to simplify inventories, three buckets, right? You have physical devices, software, and data. And so in this assessment, uh, in the phase one, uh, you kind of have to get the hardware and the software done first before you really dig into the data inventory anyway. So it's more high level here. For the for the software one on that? You want me to go back? But sure. How would you mark it if they they said, well, you know, we have an RMM running that, you know, you know, we could pull a list of software that's running in the environment from our RMM tool. It's like it can give you a status of what's installed, but it's like not, it's not like an inventory that's really and, managed, you know. Yeah, so you could, I mean, from... I mean, you could go in like all, just pretty much all the questions. You could go either way with that. So if I said, if, if I asked, you know, do you have a software inventory? And you're like, yeah, we have a software inventory. We maintain it all in our, you know, in our database. Okay. I mean, that, that would suffice if now if the conversation goes, you know, further and it's like, yeah, we have it, but, you know, we don't monitor it regularly. We don't use it regularly. You could then. You know, and it's going to rely on your, if you want to consult on that or not kind of thing. Like, okay, you're using it, but you're not really using it. So I'm going to answer mm -hmm. false here, and then I'm going to put in the notes for the justification why I answered false is because you're not actually using it, right? Because then when you get to the roadmap time and you say, you know, one of the findings is, is you don't have a software asset inventory. And I'm like, well, yeah, we do. I know you do, but. You're not using it regularly, so we should really formalize that piece up. So you could go either way. Uh, a lot of it's going to be dependent upon where you want to take them you know, as a consultant. Because from here, so you do the level one, and let's say you go with the, the shortcut. Not really a shortcut, but the letter of the law kind of thing. You say yes, but I'm not using it, whatever. So you just click true, and you move on. As you continue to progress in building the organization's information security program, you'll eventually graduate to level two, probably. And when you mm -hmm. get to level two, then it's going to ask you, why are you actually using it and stuff like that. Got it. You know, depending on, you know, what how the conversation is going and reading the room, if, if they said, yes, we have one and it's maintained in this database, Again, that that might be enough for me, and I might just say true and just move on. Yeah, I mean, yeah, because that, that's I think that comes up a lot because you know you can define when you hear inventory, it you know, it's like some people will just be like, "Can I provide a list of things? I can give you a list of things," and it says nothing on whether or not you know how you're using that list, how often it's referenced or controlled. Yeah, and we'll and we and you know in the assessment you really touch on a lot of those other things about how things are being used, how they're being controlled. But if just the fact that you could call up and give me a list of all the things that are in the environment whenever I want to, that's it's an inventory and that would satisfy. Evan, when would be what is an example of selecting NA 
it'd be things like like it becomes a lot more obvious when you get to like the software development things. Okay. In phase one, like if we don't do any software development and we don't do we don't have any custom software, gotcha. then a lot of that stuff would just be NA. That's an obvious one. But if it came up like I don't know, like if you wouldn't really have it on like privileged users and stuff like that, stuff that we've already talked about. I guess if you've never let anybody go, like there's never been an involuntary, you know, there's never been an involuntary separation here at the organization. And there never will be. Yeah, I guess you could kind of do an NA. Oh, yeah. All right, let's get into classifications. So this is like classifying your information, you know, whether it's confidential, public, uh, that there's many ways that you could be classifying. But do you guys have some kind of formal information classification guidelines that you follow? I mean, I don't know of any that we use. I mean, everything's important to us. Yeah, nothing nothing formal. Like, we we sort of treat everything like it's confidential, but nothing beyond that. And what about removable media? Let's talk about that. Uh, what do you guys do with the media once it's no longer um, needed? What's removable media? Like a like a um, flash drive, zip disk, zip, zip disk. disk. So what's like the question? Do we a floppy? What do we? If you still what have do we those? do it? We we use those. Yeah, we use floppies and USB drives. What about when you're done with them? Do you take the appropriate steps, like overriding them for reuse? Do you have any procedures in place? I mean, I'll that? delete stuff off mine. I don't know what everyone else does, so I guess I don't know. I guess we don't have anything in place. Yeah, I think for the most part, um, our IT people, you know, repurpose them, maybe. I don't know of any. They have a box of them. Not sure of their process, though, either one of you? I don't know what the process is. I don't know. I think it's in one of the policies that we signed off on. I remember one of them said something about media now that you mentioned it, but I don't remember what it said. Yeah. And to pause on this one really quick. When when you're talking to because this is administrative controls, right? So putting this into context, when the executive or wherever you're talking to is, you know, says, Well, I'm not sure what IT does, blah, blah, then the answer here would be false. Because this is about the administrative controls, right? This is about driving policy and governance around these things. Yeah. So that helps when you're going through context because other, otherwise it's like, well, IT does that. You know, do you know, are there specific rules right. that they need to follow? Things that we're telling IT that they need to do with these things. Um, and that then that puts it on the company, right? The administrative controls. It's like, no, we don't have anything like that. Well, then the answer here would be Jordan's false. saying, well, you know, I do this on my own, but, you know, not sure that that was an indicator there, too. Yeah, lack of consistency certainly lends itself to lack of governance. So mm -hmm. at this point, then you would not speak to IT. It would just be false and move on. Correct. Yep. It'll come up again when you get to phase three. Okay. All right. So we've already addressed um, data that's stored on this me on the media. So we're going to go ahead and... Well, and the difference here is removable media, and this is all media. Oh, so gotcha. it, it's a little bit different, um, and it may not be obvious when you're going through the assessment. One is removable media. We It brings a different risks, you know, when your data is mobile versus, you know, like we decommission a server or decommission a uh, a workstation. It's more of that kind of media here. Okay. All right. So let's talk then about what you guys do then when when other types of media are destroyed, like when, laptops or servers or what is, do you have a formal process that you follow? For computers, we typically just tell IT to, um, you know, that, you know, when, when we're going to like remove a computer from the company, we just usually give it to them and they, and we ask them to donate it to, uh, computers for, 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 uh, 
tots. Okay. And, and uh, but would paper fall into this category? Like we got a lot of file cabinets with stuff on it. In terms of how you destroy those? Yeah, and we do have a we do have a company that comes by once a week. We have these bins, and they uh, they shred the paper because I want to make sure those papers are gone. Right. I'm not. Sh- I don't Deepers. think paper falls in line with media. Am I right? Yes. No. I'm asking you. I think now I'm I think out it of would. the CISO role. I don't I, know. I, I can't remember if paper specifically comes up in a different question, but I would say it counts as media. This doesn't say specifically digital. Okay. Yeah. So um, it does count here, but you know, to for the VC, so who who takes and that's kind of the flexibility of the tool too. For a VC, so who doesn't consider paper to be media, you can answer it. True. Still and just justify that. You know, like. When I'm talking media, I'm talking this. But the best way to do it would be to consider all media, physical and digital. So you would consider his answer a true? I would have considered that a false. No, because I would ask about would ask about data, you know, media. Okay. And so if he, if he went to paper and he said, well, on paper we do this thing and stuff like that, then I then I would ask. Uh, do you do the same with hard drives? I mean, do you do the same with other types of media? And uh, it gives a good indication on whether or not this is formalized or not. Mm-hmm. That's a legitimate. That would if if you do a paper, but you don't do it with the other stuff. That would be a legitimate gap that I would select false and uh, point that out. Well, and and on the other uh, the other piece of it is at the beginning of the assessment. Uh, the CEO specifically said, I want to know what I'm doing right. And this would be an opportunity to call out, you're doing paper, right? Well, potentially, if they have a process for that, now just apply it to digital. Okay. And do you guys use a third party for your media disposal? I guess probably not since we're not really doing that. Just well, for, for the paper. paper. Yeah, for the paper we do, but not for the hard drives okay. and other stuff. All right. All right. We're going to move on to cloud services. Do you have a complete inventory of all cloud services that you maintain? What, like Dropbox? Meaning that being one of the cloud services? Is that what Are you asking is? the question? I mean, I use Dropbox. But do you guys have an inventory of all cloud services? Mm, I guess I don't know. And I, I think that that's kind of a concern because we don't really know, I think, where the data is going and all the cloud services that we're maybe using. Yeah. Is that data encrypted that's moving from cloud services to and from? I would think somewhere, some places it probably is, but the fact that we don't know all the cloud services, I can't. I don't think we can answer that if it's true everywhere. I mean, my, my cousin told me that Dropbox is secure, so... Yeah. I so use... Therefore, therefore, your whole system is secure. Yeah. Good job, Jordan, CEO. I use things. Things? All right. That's all we have time for with this particular podcast. We got through sections three and four. So we'll pick up with five next time awesome. we meet, which is next Friday. Nice right. job, Meg. That was, that was good. It was good. And this is access control. That'll be fine. I have to I have to stick to the questions much more than you guys because of my lack of familiarity. Yeah, but that's but you, you navigated it well in my opinion. You know, it didn't yeah. come off didn't come off as like you don't know what you're talking about. It came off more like conversational. Yeah. Well that's good. Yeah. And I, I agree. do utilize those little eye bubbles. I don't know if you guys notice or if the audience noticed that, but when you're really new to this, those eye bubbles are a lifesaver for me. Yeah, it provides more context. And what, I think what does the know, eye bubble say on the on this one? Like the is. Yeah, what does it say? On the bottom one or this one? Oh, either one. I'm just curious. 
review all cloud services that are used by the organization and develop a detailed inventory. Depending upon the cloud services that are employed, create an inventory that contains the name of the application, operating system category, description, approx approximate number of users, system critical criticality, data sensitivity, the detailed inventory is critical to cloud risk management. So in, in an assessment, like if you, you click on that bubble, you're, try, you're trying to get a little assistance. You know, obviously in, in the assessment, you know, just, just reading that bubble might not always be appropriate. You know, there's a lot of stuff in there about, about that. Or I guess maybe it could, if, if they're asking like, well, what, what do we mean by inventory? What do we have to have recorded? Exactly. And then it, then it gives you that right there so that's nice yeah so it's if it's you have more a, like here's and if you're good at skimming some people are really good at skimming they can skim out and pick out those keywords pretty fast yep that's what i do yeah it's, All right. it's good guidance for that but one of the things i you know and again i mentioned it in the last podcast i mean every time you do these things when you open yourself up to other people's perspectives you learn i mean i learn mm -hmm. i learn you know and you're always learning Things I picked up on that I think were really key in this episode that weren't so much in the last episode is the questions about what if, what if, you know, would I check this true or false in all these what ifs, right? Yeah. And you're always going to have that when you're doing an assessment. You can always, if you dig deep enough or go change the scope a little bit or change the perspective a little bit, you can answer true, false to really any one of these questions. But if you, um, and so you get caught up in that, right? Well, if I, but you know, not this one place here, this little minute thing, if it's 99% or, you know, if just the answer to the question is true, leave it there. You know, if you have, if you want to keep continuing to, if you want to go deeper, cause sometimes we want to, you know, we always have this feeling like I want to provide more value. Yeah. As long as, as, long as the customer is permitting it, they're not getting frustrated, they're not seeing this as a waste of time, then go deeper. There's nothing wrong with that. And then answer the question differently. I loved using the notes section for when I, whichever way I go, because it will come up maybe when you're doing the roadmap or something else. It's like, well, we actually do do that. Yeah, I understand that you do do that, but you're not using it. You know, some justification of why answer true or false. Mm -hmm. Because that helps to drive the risk forward anyway, right? In terms of the score of the overall risk, it all ends up being a wash at the end because there's enough of those true falses and variabilities spread over a wider area that it doesn't really affect the overall score dramatically when you do that. Yeah. So a lot of it's you know, depends. When I, when I gave a risk assessment, myself included, got really caught up on the word formal because that's mentioned many times throughout the assessment. And it was like, well, you know, we've got something, but is it formal? Probably not. And it, and for every one of those that, that called for formal, I would mark false. Yeah. Well, and they just answered it too. And they there would be agreement there because they said, well, we do a lot of the thing. Is it formal? Probably not. That's the answer. Yeah. Right there, false. Mm -hmm. So it could, but you see some people who do assessments, you know, uh, the answer, da 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 da, probably not. And you're like, well, but tell me where, you know, you do it, da 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 da. And then you're like, I'm going to go ahead and mark true because you really are formal. That's it's usually a waste of time. I won't go down yeah. those rabbit holes. You know, it was, it was interesting because with that particular example, because of the OSINT that I had done ahead of time and speaking with the guy that I was going to do the assessment with, I knew that there was some angst between him and administration because administration thought it was an IT thing and wanted him to do all of the work. And so I used that throughout the review or the assessment because when he would start to say, well, yeah, we kind of do it, but formal... I would say, hey, you know, if this is one of those things that you really want them, you want participation and buy-in, making this formal is going to help with that. 
and and he really then bought into that. That's a good that's a good example. That's awesome. What do you think about like as you're doing this assessment, if if they are an organization that has some compliance requirements and as you're kind of doing the true and false and and like you said in some ways you can be like you know it's, i can i could justify this as a true or a false um but if the compliance that they need would basically say no that wasn't enough to make this true where i mean where would that come up i mean w- would that be something that we would want to understand while doing the assessment like okay really for this to be true for them in this industry to get the compliance that they want this is actually what they they have to be doing so you can't really justify anything else yeah so that would so in in many cases that would be i don't consider compliance as much when i'm doing the assessment there is a compliance section in the assessment you know where i would ask if if your compliance is you know if you're tracking that formally, if you're, you know, doing audits and what have you. So I would leave that as a separate sort of initiative. What I want to focus on here is building a security program that's based on risk management. But, you know, that would also be probably on their mind if it is a compliance driven thing. So they would probably answer false knowing that. It's um it's really rare to get caught up in the minutia of the when you deliver the assessment and start building the security program. Uh, because there's just so many structural, fundamental things that are missing, so we, it would mm-hmm. be a waste of time to focus on the on the minutia now, as opposed to you know the foundational stuff. A waste. Yeah, it's a waste because you did the minutia thing, but you don't have the foundation for it to stand on. So, uh, yeah, there's just there's so many, and that's the thing I think a lot of people get caught up on is there's so many what ifs and so many different you know scenarios you could you could play out in your mind to answer one thing one way or the other and the advice there is is just continue the progress you can always come back and revisit that later mm-hmm. you know so if you answered true and then find out later that actually you know yes it's true but not it's not going to be enough to satisfy compliance. Well, then you can make that decision later on on whether you want to change that. It's good. Because nothing's set in stone either, right? I mean, you're going to make these things and you're going to find out later that some of the things you thought were true are actually false. You're going to find out, um, you know, as you're making progress, you're going to change things from false to true. And it's a, it's kind of a clay thing, you know, lump of clay. You just continue to mold it. Evan, Questions. did you hear my lists? I did hear your list, and I thought it was fantastic. Thank you. Just You don't even just, understand how far out of my comfort zone that is. See? That's good. Get out of your comfort zone. You guys I are rubbing off of me. Uh-huh. All right. We'll get episode the lift next. More often. Yeah, you should. Next, uh, next episode, it's me. I'll take uh, the VCSO role, and ooh, ooh, ooh. Meg will be the CEO, and Jordan will be the CFO. And I got the pocketbook. I got the money. Why did I get Evan? I don't know. Right? That's, how many people have asked that over the years? I mean, come on. Why so, did I get you Evan? You did that on purpose, Jordan. That's probably what my yeah. my wife probably asks her that on a daily daily basis. Why did I get Evan? Poor lady. That's it. My eyes are like so. Uh, I'm. I need sleep, man. I'm gonna go, go take a nap now. Sleep, man. Yeah, right. go take a nap. All right. Take care, you guys. Right, we'll guys, see you next have episode. Have a good weekend, everyone. See you, that was good. Bye-bye. Bye.